Um, good morning, good afternoon. We are happy to launch today our new practitioner guide on human rights narratives at the UN, and we are especially thankful to the permanent mission to the UN of Luxembourg, who is co-hosting the event today. Uh, I am Marianne Bertrand, the campaign and mobilization manager at ISHR, and I will be moderating this event today. And before giving the floor to His Excellency, the Ambassador Mark, Mark Bischler, who will make the introductory remarks, I just want to go through a couple of practical points. So the first one is that the event is recorded and will be posted on ISHR um, um, YouTube channel afterwards. The second is that the event is only available in English and we will not provide interpretation. Uh, apologies for that. And um, after the presentation of, the, of our speakers, you will have a space um, to comment and ask questions. So please, please feel free to use the Q&A uh, chat bo uh, box function uh, to send your questions to the speakers. So let's now start and launch a seat at the table. And Mr. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, dear, dear human rights experts, dear human rights defenders and dear colleagues, uh, in the name of Luxembourg and the government of Luxembourg, I would really like to welcome you uh, on my part, uh, all of you to this event of uh, a seat at the table and the launch of the new guide to crafting narratives about human rights and the people who defend them at the United Nations. Let me start by thanking the Ford Foundation for their valuable support to this project and the experts uh, and the authors for the elaboration of this guide, which is very topical. It's very rich in uh, insight and information, and it will be very useful for all the stakeholders, especially here also at the, at the UN. Luxembourg on its side has always given much importance to the inclusion of all voices at the UN and in other international fora. As such, one of our uh, four main priorities uh, for Luxembourg's campaign to become a member of the Human Rights Council for the period 22 to 24 is exactly to support the rule of law, the civic space, the human rights defenders and the fight against impunity. It is the first time that Luxembourg is a candidate to become a member of the Human Rights Council and it is both our duty and our honor also to defend human rights organizations and to ensure that not only they have a seat at the table, but also that they will be heard as clearly as possible. If we are elected as a member of the council, we intend to create a framework where civil society and human rights defenders have the possibility to amplify their voices, to defend their causes and to achieve their objectives also. We believe that we all should be able to stand up for human rights and that together we are stronger indeed in achieving our objectives. We are delighted to promote this event together with ISHR and to promote the objective of inclusivity and a positive narrative and thereby help all stakeholders to have a fruitful debate. As a diplomat, a large part of the work uh, consists in pre uh, preparing speeches and uh, building a narrative while making sure at the same time that our main points come across at the right time also, very important, to our audience in an effective and understandable way. Our objective is always to clearly make our point and to get our interlocutors to think, to react and even to act. The guide published by ISHR is a very useful tool to provide guidance to all stakeholders within the UN and probably beyond to bring about change and to build a narrative which is positive and respectful of all actors. The nine key recommendations and the messaging pathway present an essential basis for writing those speeches and a positive narrative is particularly, is particularly crucial at this exact point in time when a lot of the personal contact has been lost due to the pandemic. This change in personal interactions make negotiations more difficult and more strenuous. A positive narrative is thus even more important. Here in Geneva, Luxembourg will definitely draw on this guide to improve its positive narrative 
during our different interventions, be it at the Human Rights Council or during other interventions at the UN. Additionally, Luxembourg will also try to increase the inclusion of further positive narratives with other international organizations based here in Geneva. And as a matter of fact, it will be part of our campaign for the Human Rights Council. Finally, uh, let me also invite all of my colleagues to implement the recommendations that can be found in this guide when referring to human rights defenders or when drafting their interventions. It will lead to a more positive dialogue and it will help us to achieve our objective of equal human rights for all and of inclusivity faster. So once again, let me thank ISHR and all the experts for their efforts in writing this report. All stakeholders deserve to be heard in a meaningful way at the UN. I thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. And indeed, the, the stories and narratives that are told about human rights defenders at the UN have a major impact uh, how, on how they are understood and uh, protected, supported on the ground. Um, according to a research that we, ra we ran last year on Media Cloud, which is like an, an open source uh, platform that tracks the content of online media, uh, between January 2019 and June 2020, the UN was the forum most associated with human rights defenders in English speaking media globally. So for almost 40% of the stories, uh, which reference references, um, they also referred to the UN. So it's evident, it is evident to us that narratives, how we speak, the stories that we put forward uh, into the world are crucial. Um, there is also a growing body of evidence that hope-based uh, and values-led narratives are most effective in changing people's minds, hearts, and motivating action. And this is why over the past nine months, and thanks to the Ford Foundation, together with a team of communication experts, um, we conducted research and consulted key st stakeholders uh, to um, assess the prevailing narrative. We explored the perception uh, that diplomats working at the UN have about human rights and people who defend them. And uh, the research also informed the creation of the new narrative strategy that we are uh, launching today. And we believe uh, this new narrative strategy is more effective. The guide we are launching today, and you can see you have the link um, in the chat, is for anyone working within or engage, engaging with the UN um, to promote and, and protect human rights, uh, whether they be diplomats, frontline activists, leaders, uh, or advocates working wi within NGOs. We hope it will help all of us to develop winning narratives that highlight the valuable contribution made by people who defend human rights at the UN and in their communities on the ground. Our next speakers are the authors of the guide. Uh, so let me introduce you to Tom Clark, who's a human rights campa campaigner and a communication specialist. Welcome, Tom. And Sophie Mulfing, who's a human rights communication specialist. Hello, Sophie. They will briefly explain the methodology we use and the principal findings of the guide. So Tom and Sophie, the floor is yours. Hello, Marianne. Thank you very much. Um, firstly, a big thank you from Tommy and I to all the participants, uh, research participants and practitioners who gave us their time and insights. Many of you are here with us again today. Um, thanks also to Team ISHR, it's been a fascinating and a fantastically collaborative journey. Um, so on to the process behind uh, the writing of this new narratives guide and some of the recommendations that you'll find within it. And Diego, we can have the first slide up of the presentation. Uh, so as a starting point, we asked a range of diplomats and other human rights practitioners to explain in their own words what the terms human rights meant to them. Uh, we combined and tweaked and retested their answers to arrive at this broadly consensual definition that you can see on the screen. The central premise um, provided a good base for crafting narratives around the people who defend and extend these human rights, whether that's at the UN or elsewhere. 
And of note in the definition that we came to was the part about helping all of us to create a better future, which does two of the things we're keen to promote here in this guide. First of all, it says very clearly that we all have our part to play. This means we can all contribute to the advancement of human rights and by extension to the mainstreaming of the defending of human rights. And secondly, it states the vision and destination that we are all working towards. That is a better future. So on to uh, narratives a little bit. Um, tell you a little bit about them. Creative a narrative is like creative a mosaic. Each tile that we put down or each story that we tell can be different, but eventually a larger picture starts to form. So if we keep playing down tiles of a similar tone, that tone will end up dominating the bigger picture. The stories that we put out are like the colored tiles or the tessellations on the cover of the practitioner's guide that you can see in front of you. And narratives provide frameworks through which we see the world and they serve the interests of those who create them. As everyone here well knows, they're often used to shut down conversations or to keep certain ideas in place, such as legitimizing existing power relationships or criminalizing the work of people who defend human rights. But we can also change what the dominant narratives are. And the conscious crafting and dissemination of common narratives across a movement can be a powerful tool for change. So when we talk about narrative change, we're talking about which of the stories that we all put out into the world or which of the colors we want to end up dominating. And that's whether you're a diplomat, a community activist or an NGO worker. It certainly takes resources, time, repetition and multiple voices to create a new narrative and to shift the old ones. The challenge is to stay mindful of the bigger picture that we want to create about human rights and the people who defend them. And changing our habits won't happen overnight, but by staying mindful of the bigger picture that we do want to create, we can start to amend our day-to-day -day messaging. With the next slide, I'll tell you a little bit about our research process for the guide. Our task was to craft a narrative which would help raise the perceived legitimacy of defenders and enhance collaboration in UN forums. For this, we needed to understand current narratives and mindsets across the movement and in UN spaces, and to identify overlapping or conflicting motivations and parameters. Our research was qualitative. We carried out desktop research of human rights websites and recent media releases, reports and annual reports, to get a feel for the existing narrative being pushed by the movement. We also looked at human rights councils addresses and NGO statements, as well as broad media trends around the human rights reporting. We explored existing research and reports around hope and values led communication, as well as on framing, priming, foresight and resources in the guide. They were very good read, I recommend them. Uh, we ran a series of in-depth consultations through anonymized interviews with former and serving diplomats and UN special experts. Again, many of you are here with us today. Thank you. And also with experienced funders that we're working on, that are working on questions of narratives and human rights. We also ran a wider anonymized survey with diplomats for a final round of feedback of personal and professional perceptions around defenders. And we held several focus groups and workshops with human rights practitioners. This was to make sure we had understood their needs and parameters and to see whether our reflections correlated with their experience. And over the 10 months that we've been working on this, we also uh, worked very closely with the ISHR team and key stakeholders to refine and settle our messages. We took what we found and we formulated it in a way that we hope will excite our base, persuade the undecided, and expose the opponents for the outliers they are. Tommy will tell you a lot more about this. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'll just go to the next slide. Thanks, Diego. Um, thanks, Sophie. And thanks, everyone, again, for joining us today. Uh, yeah, really, really hope that you find the guide useful and, and hopefully encouraging. Um, I'm coming today from uh, in Australia. And uh, before I go on with the slides, just we have a tradition here at the beginning of uh, gatherings or meetings to pay respect the traditional owners of the land. 
So I just want to start by acknowledging that I'm on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, um, and that sovereignty was never ceded, and it, it, it is, and it, sorry, it was, always will be Aboriginal land. Um, so I wanted to start uh, with this slide. You can see there uh, the, the UN slogan, peace, dignity, and equality on a healthy planet. It's just lovely. I, like, I really love this slogan. Um, and I think the reason I love it is it, it really goes to the heart of what human rights are all about. And um, as Sophie said, something I liked about the, the process of this uh, project was revisiting a lot of that source material uh, from the UN, the declaration and, and the preambles and everything. And there's just so much great talk about, you know, the inherent dignity and equality and rights of all members of the human family and how this is the foundation for freedom, justice and, and, and peace around the world. And in, in many ways, um, a lot of the recommendations in our guide are, are really about getting back to the basics. They're all about what do we want to achieve with them? And I think it's sometimes a bit easy to, to lose sight that these, these words are really uh, there for us. Um, so it's yeah, worth re revisiting if, if, if you're not already. Um, and so our advice here is really to lean into this UN setting and really embrace uh, and lead with these kind of values. Uh, essentially, we're saying, talk about them as much as you can. And we say this because we know uh, that values have a far more uh, persuasive power than, than facts and figures alone. But definitely facts are fantastic and, um, and, and we like them, but they, they generally serve to reinforce or confirm our beliefs. And they need to be in the mix, for sure. Um, but, but it's values that can actually shift our beliefs and our political positions and, and understanding of things. Uh, the, the, one of the sayings is if you can win people with the values, if they trust you on your values, they'll, they'll be more likely to follow you um, with that policy detail or trust you as well in, that, in the policy or advocacy ask. Uh, and we also know that um, frequency helps. Uh, and this is likely due to uh, what, what, something they call the, the priming effect, which if we, if we advance in the slide, I'll, I'll, I'll keep talking about. Um, so if you got that, Diego, can we go to the next? Yeah, great. Um, so priming is this concept that uh, being exposed to certain stimulus will influence your subsequent response to other stimulus, even if they're not related. Uh, and I don't just mean in terms of how we're thinking, but in our actual actions as well, or our decisions. And so the example I've used here is, is um, you know, if we were to plan a we would only use these kinds of words, you know, tired, slow, achy, old, etc. cetera, um, that uh, when we finished and got off our seats, uh, we would probably leave at a much slower rate than had we only played with uh, energetic or uh, youthful words. And um, there have been a number of experiments along these lines uh, which have, have shown this to be the case. Uh, it's sort of as if... Uh, mere exposure to the words uh, will translate into how we feel and, and to, to how we act. Uh, it, you know, it's pretty fascinating stuff. Um, it's not clear uh, how long the, this priming effect lasts on us, but it's certainly real. Like it's something that's been measured um, in many experiments and, and now with you know, platforms like Facebook and, and other ones, we've got these really massive uh, sets of data where you know, it's allowed researchers and experimenters to really test um, with ads or against each other when, when you're leading with, with values, when you're doing that values priming, um, so it's called. Um, so I guess the advice I'm trying to land on here is that um, being very liberal with the words we use about uh, the values that relate to human rights, so universality, equality, justice, peace, these kind of things, um, is it, it's, it's a bit like adding compost or fertilizer to your garden. You know, it's not gonna guarantee that every seed that you plant will sprout and take root, but it certainly uh, increases your, your chances. The, 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 the operating environment, environment is, is friendlier to your cause. Um, I'll just go to the next uh, slide, Diego. Thanks. And you can see here on this chart that um, values can largely be grouped um, and the ones that, that we've been talking about here live in, that, in the green area and in the top corner there. And the theory here is if you want to encourage uh, action uh, that relates to universalism, then they're the values that you want, that you want to prime. 
Um, whereas if I was trying to convince the High Commissioner to throw an awesome end of council session party, um, I'd be much better couching my messages at the other end of the spectrum there, the, in sort of the values of hedonism and so on. Um, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll hand back to Sophie for the, for the next sli few slides. Sophie, you have to unmute. Uh -huh. I'm sorry, here I am. <laughs> we've, uh, we've called this next slide the arc of history uh, because while it's undeniable that defending human rights can be dangerous work, people defending human rights have also collectively delivered profound and positive change around the world. But we are unfortunately generally not so good at taking the time to acknowledge these successes. And we have the reason and urgent, but it is very important. It's essential that the human rights victories are celebrated, both of individuals, of movements, to show that change is indeed possible. So we must collect and disseminate these positive stories um, in order to inspire and engage others to support human rights and the people who defend them. And also very importantly, to elevate and reinforce the perceived status of defenders as essential, informed and impactful actors. Um, there's a very good example currently on the ISHR website that outlines the, the advances, the huge advances over the last 10 years in recognition of SOGI rights at the United Nations uh, Human Rights Council. Um, and it's important to show that we're on this timeline, that we all have the individual and collective agency to make this change happen and to be on the right side of history. We have to also provide a clear vision of the future that we're trying to create to show what are the outcomes of the policies and actions that we're advocating for and what our destination looks like. So we really need to promote this destination. Next slide is uh, called uh, Dance to Your Own Songs because a way of promoting our, our destination, our vision, is to write our own music. Um, we can't let violations define or dominate our stories. Instead, we should be dancing to the stories that we write about our motivations and our achievements. So it's important that rather than reacting to our opponent's agendas, we put out more of the stories or tiles for the mosaic and the narrative that showcase our victories and promote our vision and set our own agenda. So whilst it's absolutely important that we continue to call out injustices and atrocities, we should always contextualize these within a narrative of all that we do, that we dream and that we deliver as people who defend human rights. And even when we're familiar with the series and we try to remain mindful of the, the larger mosaic that we want to be making, our intentions can be overwhelmed by the reality and the challenges of our work. For sure, it may seem hard to proactively advance your own agenda when you're facing attacks or struggling to respond to urgent human rights crisis. But embracing proactive mindsets and strategies will absolutely put our movement on the front foot. Certainly a lot of this work needs to begin at a strategic and structural level and requires buy-in from all levels of uh, an organization. You'll need to create space and capacity to develop these new narratives and the opportunities to carry them and amplify them. Finally, try to align your actions and tactics with the narratives that you want to promote. You embody your principle, be the narrative. Because the way we are seen to work and organize carries a lot of meaning in and of itself. So let's consider our role and decide what actions can best reflect or amplify what our organizations bring to collective efforts. With discipline and practice, we can get better at this. So translating all of this advice in our day-to-day -day work and um, make sure that we tell our own stories and dedicate time and resources to setting and pursuing our own goals. Over to Tommy. Great, thanks. Um, I, was, I was really happy uh, when we got to uh, use that, that phrase about dancing to your own song. Um, it reminds me, it's just an aside, but it reminds me of an auntie, an activist auntie, which obviously every family should have a few activist aunties. Um, but she was very fond of quoting uh, the Russian feminist and anarchist Emma Goldman, who said, if I can't dance at your revolution, I'm not coming. 
Um, so a slightly different meaning, I know, but to me, it's a, a great reminder um, to never lose sight of the, the type of future we're trying to create. You know, why, why are we doing this? Um, anyway, back to the slide. Um, normalize, normalizing best practice. Uh, what I mean by this uh, sort of goes to the, to the focus of what we do our advocacy on. Um, and I think the human rights movement uh, in general, and, and, I, and I admit I'm very guilty of this myself, um, trying to get out of that habit, but we, we do have a tendency to get really angry and uh, just to focus on everything that our governments are doing, doing wrong. Now, of course, this is, is very understandable. Um, there's lots to be angry about. And uh, I certainly don't want to suggest that we're saying to turn a blind eye to wrongdoing. Uh, however, when you step back, you do realize that the net effect of such advocacy when it's done over decades um, is that we, you know, we risk normalizing the very violations that we're, that we're trying to call out. And we risk uh, adding to a narrative that actually erodes faith in, in government as an institution and its, its ability um, to deliver vital services or to be the source of positive change. Uh, so there's a need just to, sort of, I guess, increase the amount of time uh, that we spend giving voice to what best practice looks like. So we need to remind our audience uh, what responsible government looks like or responsible uh, business. Um, or if they're not familiar with that, then we need to paint a picture so that they can become familiar with, with what responsible government would look like. Um, and again, I just want to stress, I'm not saying to forgive bad actions, because I think that's maybe one of the misconceptions or a common sort of misconception maybe with, with the guide. I'm not saying to forgive bad actions. And, uh, you know, an example would be, if personally, if I was addressing the, the UN Human Rights Council tomorrow, you can, you can guarantee you know, that I would want to draw attention to um, the horrific cruelty that, that my government, the Australian government, is deliberately inflicting on refugees and, and people seeking safety. Now, I, I certainly wouldn't ignore that. Uh, but I would hope, or I definitely try to in, 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 that, in, in it, any talk, um, provide a bigger picture uh, so that the story wasn't just defined by those violations. You know, and what this would look like, I guess, is I'll try to make sure that, um, a, you know, I'll talk about the brave refugees um, like Aziz, who I, th I think might be joining us tonight um, in this session, uh, who refuse to have their spirit or dignity crushed. Um, I'll talk about the ordinary members of the public that, that spoke out in solidarity. Um, and I'd make sure to really spell out that good governments, the ones that respect international human rights law, uh, they actually take steps to create safe pathways to protection uh, and to ensure that people in need of safety can find it and are given a chance to rebuild their lives in and as part of a community. So I'd be really try to give, give words to what the solution looks like. Um, so normalizing, when we say normalizing that sort of best practice, it's a bit like modeling good behavior. And that might be a phrase that uh, parents are, are familiar with. You know, it's sort of this idea that if we come into the room and we you know, go off at our kids for not washing their dishes or tidying up or whatever the, the problem is, um, it can reinforce a particular dynamic where their defenses go up and yeah, we, we know the scene. Um, whereas all of the sort of expert advice is, no, no, you need to focus on the examples of good behavior and that you want to encourage and, and reinforce. Um, or to put an at less stick. Um, and so the, the, one of the last tips on this slide is um, just a reminder about, uh, I guess it goes back to dancing to your own songs. So try your absolute best uh, not to buy into your opponent's framing on a particular debate or issue. So again, to use the refugee policy as an example, um, my government really frames that policy of being, as being about boats and borders and preventing deaths at sea. And as advocates, yep, we can, we can try to unpick those arguments with, with logic um, or internet arguments about law. But in doing so, we, we actually, unfortunately, just sort of reinforce those very conversations. You know, the, conversation, the conversations we're having still end up being about borders and boats. Um, whereas our side does much better when, when the conversation is about you know, seeking safety or a chance for a better life for your children or new beginnings uh, in, as part of a great community. So it's that, that idea of knowing before you, you begin your campaign or advocacy, what, what's the frame that you want the conversations ideally to, to, to take place in? Um, I'll just go to the next slide. And to, to finish our presentation, um, I didn't want to just sort of read out the script of our suggested narrative about human rights defenders. 
But I thought I'd just quickly recap on the beats because um, that, I guess that way doesn't have to be overly prescriptive. And as, as a broader note, we read that the guy didn't receive this being to you know, do exactly this and then do exactly that type of instructions. We, we really hope to provide some building blocks or concepts that uh, you, know, you can then take and, and use as you want in, in, the, in the relevant context. Um, so the first kind of beat here is about a shared humanity. And again, the, you know, the, the, the drafters of the Universal Declaration really understood this. The very opening line, I think it is, of the preamble talks about all members of the human family. So that's, this is an important uh, concept to build or the foundations to build our messages on. Uh, the next is about respect and fairness. And I think this is a, just a reminder or an appeal, I guess, to our better nature. You know, we know that we're at our best when we're nice to other people. And we know that our lives are better when, when people are nice to us. Uh, the next point is participation and inclusion is needed. And as Sophie said at the beginning, this is, it's not just about motivating support for your cause, but hopefully it does, it does that as well. But it also plays a role in countering uh, the othering um, of some of the regressive narratives about human rights defenders as sort of alienating them or criminalizing them. Um, then of course, we come to the point in any narrative where we, we, we can't ignore our villains, we have to name them and we have to explain the power imbalances that they, um, that they use. And we wanna to seek to expose uh, how they use that to their advantage and expose the kind of uh, tricks around dividing and conquering essentially. Um, and the, another key point on the problem is that it needs to be described as human made, uh, because if it's not human made, then it can't be human fixed. You know, it needs to be within our control. Um, then we've got the definition, um, which is, I guess, a bit specific to this context, but you do know it ends on that, with that forward future looking momentum. And I think our, the movement of the progressive movement or the human rights movement really should always be about tomorrow. Never, never so much about yesterday. It's always forward looking. Um, and then to end with, every, you know, everyone is welcome, everyone benefits. So we do want to return or loop back to this, um, uh, the values we began with, in this case, universalism and, and our, our common humanity. Um, and that's, I think, all the slides I, all, all the slides I have. So I'll, I'll hand back and, and thanks again for joining us tonight. Tom and Sophie, I want to publicly say thank you for, for all the work you've put in this. Um, and for our, or our, our participants, you can have you can ask questions to Tom and Sophie. Please use the Q and A uh, function that we have on the Zoom. Um, so our next speaker is Mary Lawler. Mary is a UN Special Rapporteur on the situation of human rights defenders, and uh, we ask Mary to address several questions in her intervention today. So Mary, how can or does enhanced uh, understanding, awareness and support for the work of defenders contribute to their perception, to their protection, sorry? In contrast, what is the situation uh, faced by human rights defenders in terms of defamation, hate speech, criminalization around the world? And can you share perhaps examples where defenders have successfully shifted the narrative um, do you, does your mandate intend to work on narratives and how? So welcome, Mary. Thank you for being here today and the floor is yours. Thank you very much for having me here today. And I must say, I was really looking forward to this because I felt it would be a fun meeting. Uh, so uh, it's over a year since I took up uh, the mandate and in uh, that time obviously I haven't been able to meet anyone except online, had to work in a very different way to the, our, my predecessors like you and um, I've had online meetings with hundreds and hundreds of human rights defenders. I think I uh, I did a report on the first year and um, the, the numbers even surprised me. Uh, so, and the majority of them are women um, so far. Not, not by much, but still a majority, important. Um, and the meetings have usually been quite small, two or three at a time, with four or five uh, at maximum, um, you know, uh, to get more of an insight into them and, and their work. And they tell me about their work, they talk about their work and the challenges that they face and who their allies are. I send them a questionnaire beforehand 
Um, and part, some of the questions relate to obviously who they are, what their work is, the challenges they face. But then there are others where I ask them, who are their allies? And I have one question, which I, I find very interesting, uh, which is, uh, can they tell me about uh, uh, something they're proud of doing or um, a, a small victory they've had? And over time, I hope to collect these. Um, but it just to, to kind of um, have more of a knowledge because I have met some of these defenders I know from my previous work, but I'm trying to reach out to rural marginalized defenders who aren't um, very connected. So, so a lot of them I wouldn't know. Um, uh, so, and of course, the, the ones that I'm prioritizing are the remote marginalized uh, defenders who don't have access to the UN and very often don't even have access to a regional mechanism or a regional network or even a national network. So I was interested to see this report about narratives. It's clearly a very live issue being addressed by defenders all over the world who face smears, as you said, and vilification and lies and hate speech and all that. Um, and, uh, and it comes up over and over and over again in pretty much every, every meeting. Um, negative narratives about defenders no doubt create an atmosphere of vulnerability around them. As many have told me, verbal harassment increasingly online can be damaging in itself, but also uh, it can set def and, uh, defenders up. Uh, uh, so an environment is created where the threats and intimidation can move offline and, uh, and then they can be attacked, uh, physically attacked. Uh, and, and even murdered. And my last report to the Human Rights Council addressed this, the killings of human rights defenders and the threats that they faced very often before the threats escalated. I've listened to a lot of defenders uh, and uh, not only last year, but for many years before, and, and uh, to, to try and learn more about how they protect themselves. And I note in your report an emphasis on positivity and the power of reminders about how useful and valuable the work of defenders is. And I think that's right. And changing an often damaging nar narrative around defenders helps support their work. Um, I've heard from defenders who tell me how they've managed to find influential voices in their communities, whether they're religious leaders or politicians or others, and they're able to talk to them uh, and they get uh, support from them in a positive way. And they tell me how that helps. A project at the University of York in England this year studied the stigmatization of human rights defenders and compiled examples of how defenders countered it and tried and sometimes succeeded in changing the narrative about them and their work. Much of my time is also spent with uh, talking to diplomats uh, with whom I try and build relationships. Uh, and it's encouraging for me to see from your report that most of the diplomats you interviewed said they believed they had some scope to influence outcomes. And the report is right to note it's crucial to think through how we talk to diplomats and other organizations and other government officials about defenders and their work. And when I talk to a diplomat, I always try to frame uh, I've learned quite a lot already, I have to say. I always try to frame the conversation, you know, with them in the Declaration of Human Rights Defenders, and uh, to which they have all agreed. And, uh, and the right of human rights defenders to carry out their valuable, legitimate work um, in defense, peacefully, in defense of the rights of others. And I try and... Uh, 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 talk about how they contribute uh, to building civil and just societies uh, based on the rule of law, which is in the interest of the government, and they should be seen as friends and not enemies. Um, 
but many of the, and one thing I think I'll add in now, having listened to you, I'll also add my favourite uh, article of the Universal Declaration, uh, uh, Article 1, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights, they are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. So I think I'll start using that as well, because it puts us all in the same boat. Um, so, uh, most of the conversations, I'm afraid to say, I have with government and business officials are at a fairly elemental level, often disputes about who is and who isn't a human rights defender, and varying degrees also about um, what human rights are. So uh, I try and approach the mandate from a people-centred approach, and I try to... Um, be a bridge between defenders and governments and um, to try and bring the concerns of human rights defenders to the relevant government, but also to try and advise both human rights defenders and governments on how to talk to each other and how to listen to each other. This report will be a valuable tool in encouraging defenders to think about how they come across. And, you know, from long years of experience, I really believe some defenders could go to, um, uh, I shouldn't say this because it got it in, me into trouble once before, but the equivalent of um, how to communicate effectively. Um, uh, and how to persuade uh, the, the, the other side, how to, of the table, or at least how to get them to listen to them. And just as we trust defenders as the best people to undertake their own risk assessments, we trust them as being the experts on their work and the experts on what they want to change. And that's very, very important. Thank you very much uh, for all the work that went into this study and for your continuing efforts to broaden the conversation by and about defenders. And thanks for having me here today. And I look forward to hearing the rest of you. Thanks so much, Mary. Um, I, I know you can still until the end of the event, so I will try after the, this first segment to take uh, the first questions to you, for you. Um, so our next speaker is Her Excellency, the Ambassador Naza Shamin Khan. She is the permanent representative of Fiji to the UN in Geneva and the current president of the Human Rights Council. And as a key target for the kind of narrative we developed, we asked her to provide an insight into the human rights stories that resonated with her and that have um, positively influenced her. We also ask her uh, why defenders are important for her work as a diplomat and for the Human Rights Council. Um, the president couldn't be here today because uh, she has a busy, busy ag agenda with the ongoing session at the Human Rights Council, but she shared with us a pre-recorded video that we will play now. Diego? Excellencies, dear colleagues, Bulavinaka, and good day. At the outset, I wish to thank the International Service for Human Rights for inviting me to participate in the launch of their new practitioner's guide entitled, A Seat at the Table. It is indeed my pleasure to address you in my capacity as President of the Human Rights Council and raise attention to this valuable and timely guide to crafting effective narratives at the United Nations about human rights and the people who defend them. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the Permanent Mission of Luxembourg for providing their support for this event. Excellencies, dear colleagues, as we all know, the Council functions most effectively when the voices of human rights defenders receive the attention that they deserve. And this guide offers insights into the kind of messages we can use that can best increase support for human rights defenders, as well as how to craft effective human rights narratives, particularly regarding human rights defenders. Human rights defenders offer expertise that state delegations draw on when engaging with the council. And they bring to the council's attention the voices and perspectives of those most vulnerable to and suffering from human rights violations. In this connection, I wish to highlight four particularly helpful recommendations 
that the guide provides for crafting effective narratives on human rights defenders, namely, identify the best practice that the defenders aim to achieve via their advocacy, provide specific examples of how defenders wish to translate human rights principles into concrete action, highlight the importance of ensuring that defenders and affected communities have their voices heard, and remind all audiences that advancing human rights is a foundational objective of the United Nations. Narratives faithful to these four recommendations will help ensure that the critical contributions of defenders to the Council receive the attention that they deserve. Excellencies, dear colleagues, the United Nations system recognizes the importance of amplifying the voices of human rights defenders and bringing their contributions to the attention of the international community. Our guiding text in this regard, of course, is General Assembly Resolution 53-144 on the Declaration of Human Rights Defenders, which importantly recognizes that everyone has the right, individually and in association with others, to promote and to strive for the protection and realization of human rights and fundamental freedoms at the national and international levels. And as you know, the Human Rights Council has taken action to help achieve the goals set forth in the Declaration. In this regard, I would like to highlight that the mandate of the Council's Special Rapporteur on the situation of human rights defenders, which is to inter alia, promote the effective implementation of the UN Declaration on Human Rights Defenders in cooperation and dialogue with governments and other actors, has been consensually extended by the Council five times since 2008, and most recently at its 43rd session last year. I would like to take this opportunity to commend the Special Rapporteur for her commitment to the fulfillment of this mandate. Her important work is helping to ensure that human rights defenders around the world can operate in a safe and enabling environment, free from hindrance and insecurity. But serious challenges remain. As the Special Rapporteur's most recent report presented to the Council in March and entitled Final Warning, Death Threats and Killings of Human Rights Defenders shows Defenders continue to be subject to threats of violence and violence itself for their work. It is for this reason that this practitioner's guide is so important. Narratives on human rights defenders that follow the recommendations set forth in the guide will lead to greater visibility for those defenders and the issues they raise in the Council. And increased visibility at the Council will not only make their advocacy more effective, but will also help to protect them. Excellencies, dear colleagues, I would like to conclude by noting that this year as President of the Human Rights Council and previously as Ambassador of the Republic of Fiji to the United Nations in Geneva, I have had the great honor to hear the voices of human rights defenders from around the world. I have heard the important from the ground information and unique perspectives that they bring, along with their sincere desire to promote and protect the human rights of all persons, and particularly the most vulnerable among us. It is my great hope that the use of this guide by council stakeholders will lead to increased support for human rights defenders and greater visibility and protection when participating in the Council's work. Vinakavakalevu, thank you. Our next speaker is Madame Ilse Brands Keris. She is the Assistant Secretary General for Human Rights, and um, among her many functions, she advises the Secretary General and the High Commissioner on how 
the UN should uh, better respond to cases of reprisals. So cases of attacks against human rights defenders for, or people for engaging uh, with the UN. Thank you for being with us, Madam Assistant Secretary General, despite the early time in New York. And my questions to you are, how would you describe the narrative around human rights defenders at the UN? In your views, how can narratives help to prevent reprisals and other threats or restrictions against human rights defenders? And how do you intend to use this guide? Thank you very much, Marianne and, and dear colleagues and friends. It's really a great pleasure to be here with you and to reflect on this. And I wanted to thank, first of all, the, the IAC HR for, for the study, for the very timely study and for this initiative overall and Ambassador Wheeler as well for the support of the permanent mission of Luxembourg. Um, it's, it's the context you remind us, I think for so many years already we have had the meta narrative of the pushback against human rights, right? And then we have had sort of, we thought, well, we take the next step of the pushback against the pushback. But that still was is rooted in this, uh, what you remind us in the study of being defensive about what we're doing, that we keep up the fort instead of taking that next step forward or really making sure that we broaden the support and really in, in, in relation to human rights defenders, of course, that entails a very direct link to making that space safe for participation and of course, to reach our ultimate goal, as you also remind us in, in, in the study. So here we have, of course, the, the very raison d'etre of the United Nations. Um, and Tom, you said it better than, than anyone, I think, but just to make that link to the values and how we need to remember and look back at those initial documents, what the UN actually stands for. And in this, uh, this point, um, I think there we all have in last years, I think more than ever before realized the power of words and the power of communication, um, because it also can contribute to a positive development and as we see uh, also create alternative realities. So how do we come back to making sure that we address this in a way that really broadens support for human rights and creates that space? Um, for human rights defenders to contribute the way that we really need them to do. Um, and certainly the UN has the unique global platform uh, it has of bringing together um, different views that in, uh, to have those encounters and to also make sure that we protect that space. Um, and, and in particular, also those individuals and human rights defenders in a broad sense um, who are there. So we have a unique responsibility as well, but that means we also have leverage. So how do, how do we use this? We, we should remember also that the messaging on human rights or, and for human rights at the UN has really gone through a remarkable trajectory. Because let's just take a step back and look at the expansion of human rights mechanisms and programs over the years as well. Um, and the gradual opening up of the UN bodies to direct testimonies and to hear stories from individuals um, has really um, gone, gone through a very positive development. Who could have, for instance, imagined women human rights defenders addressing members of the Security Council in the early decades of the United Nations? So let's remember that sharing of experience has been validated in, in bringing it in, but how do we broaden that safe, uh, space? Uh, and make it safe, uh, safer. So here we have um, the account of, I think part of that is of course the value that is brought by the human rights defenders as, as Mary and, and others already said. We really need that. We depend on the stories and the accounts that human rights defenders bring to us, other civil society representatives um, and that's why addressing the reprisals is so important, uh, particularly the ones in, in this regard, the mandate that you referred to, Marianne, my mandate is directly for engagement with the UN in the field of human rights, because of course, there is also a broader issue of reprisals. But for that specific one, I think the narrative there um, on human rights and the consequences 
of the perception of who actually is a human rights defender and what their role is, the contribution of human rights defenders is, is extremely important. And as your guide really uh, points out as well, to remember that we look forward to the, with the message of what is the society we really want to live in. And that is really um, the important link uh, to the practice of bringing in the voices uh, in all of the different fora of the UN. We know, of course, that we again have the old issue of maybe Geneva and New York having uh, different types of spaces and New York being particularly challenging maybe for, for, for the participation um, of civil society. But we are in a very privileged position um, to seek to both protect uh, that voice of, of these very important um, uh, civil society members, those who defend human rights, as you say in the study, um, instead of human rights defenders. I thought that was an interesting point as well, because we shouldn't see it in a narrow way. We really are talking about a large number of, of people who can contribute directly, but we also should amplify uh, that message. So, so this is how we really find the opportunity to do this. We have re last year in the Secretary General's call to action for human rights, we have then under that as well and linked to it, um, we have also the first UN-wide guidance note on civic space was issued last year that really should be something that, that guides all of our action that precisely put, really focuses on this space, making it safe, the protection, the promotion, but particularly I would like to emphasize the participation. That contribution is really a part of the, it really is the legitimacy of both the state to govern, as Mary was pointing out at the national level, but also for us at the UN providing the legitimacy of, of the policies adopted. Um, and, and they are obviously the message of making sure that there are no reprisals um, is, is very important, which then links to the perception of the contribution of, of the human rights defenders. So the whole common humanity argument that you already, uh, that you have expressed so clearly is obviously something that the positive narrative that we can have that in itself will have a deterrent effect on reprisals and intimidation. We need to be honest about the sufferings and violations. That's what we're bringing in. So that balancing, and you have it in the study and you mentioned it in the introduction, the balancing there or making sure that we don't shy away from the difficult stories. We need to show those and the shock effect of really awareness raising of, of those stories directly told by those uh, it happens to or their representatives. So that's something where I look forward to also the discussion in finding that balance of how we still really direct them, confront them, those stories, but also bring it to that positive uh, narrative part of looking always forward, not looking backwards, looking forward and believing that we can achieve the change um, that, that we are all aiming for. So here, what can the UN do? Just a couple of words again. We are, of course, uh, the, again, the custodian of common values. I wanted to re remind everyone or tell those who didn't see it that there was in the UN 75, there was a big survey uh, done with over a million uh, participants, a million and a half, I think, global citizens in the listening uh, exercise that was done that actually showed very, a very hopeful message in itself, which is that the UN is associated with these very basic values and with human rights as, as the key actor on human rights. And that was especially true, that hopeful belief in, in the UN was especially true among young people. So that's, that's something we also need to take into account and build on. We, see, um, we do see a trend towards more systematic engagement with civil society. It has developed. We, as in COVID-19, as we all know, this has been also in, in, in some ways uh, contributed to it because of the facility of not having to travel in order to participate where possible. And we have the whole various pillars approaching it differently with humanitarians are talking about localization. We have health community during COVID in particular talking about social accountability. 
We have the stakeholder engagement of the development pillar. So all of this is bringing it together. There is an enhanced focus on, on really making sure that we are connected directly to the community and, and, and civil society and bringing it in, bringing the voices into the UN uh, more systematically. I think the shift towards the listening, I mentioned the UN 75, I think that's something we need to take on board very seriously at the UN, all of us, the UN system as such, and of course, member states. And the, for the participation, the direct involvement in decision-making of people. Um, and this is really the making the participation effective. We've talked about participation for decades, but how do we really make it effective? Uh, which is, of course, a central part of, of a human right uh, as a principle anyway, and it leads to better decisions, as we know. So here, making the different voices heard, encouraging participation um, in all of the UN work and collecting feedback about the implementation of decisions, all of these, uh, making sure that on all of those that we really do um, bring, in, bring in civil society, um, and, and show their contribution and the legitimacy of the decisions that are made by having this test case. So we also think that we can do a lot more of joint strategizing. This is a great event to start that discussion too on what we do with those narratives. How do we formulate them in practice and that we make sure that we empower and celebrate those also survivors and also those who have gone through the difficult stories, but really the human rights defenders or those who take that important uh, action to defend the rights of others and bringing those, that, that celebration and empowerment to the forefront is something certainly very closely related to the narrative. So here we have, we, we also just very simply giving the floor to human rights defenders whenever we can, making sure that we bring them in, into events and, and actually uh, listening to them. And obviously making sure that the safe space uh, focus is there. We have various on the reprisals, that's for another discussion, but we have various projects and, and, and approaches and interactions with the different bodies, one in particular also with the Security Council to make sure that that, uh, that protection of, of those who contribute from civil society uh, really is expanded and, and the prevention of reprisals as well. So there, the co convenient role of the UN, the coalition building within civil society, bringing it all together. And this is really in the whole point of building step-by-step, step, as you remind us, the, the world we really want to have. So having that message, the human rights-based approach should become self-evident for all the action that we have so that we no longer need to say it. But to do that, we need to make sure that we keep in mind uh, that, that goal that we are heading towards. And I really salute you for having this initiative and building on the self-reflection we need to have around the narratives that, that we create. The, the mosaic, as you said, that brings into, that comes into the meta-narrative that should not, be this oppressive negative one because that way we are not going to broaden the coalition that supports uh, human rights. We should not be preaching to the converted but always look to expanding the support. So thank you very much and I'm very happy to listen to these inspiring interventions by others. Thanks. Thank you so much for these uh, very interesting points. Um, so our last um, panelist today is uh, Guadalupe Marengo. She is the head of the Global Human Rights Defenders Team at Amnesty International. And uh, welcome, Guada. Could you please share with us your experience at Amnesty using value-based narratives in campaigning? Have you applied this to Human Rights Defender and what has been the result so far? Um, so one concern that uh, we, we often listen is uh, how do you balance hope-based narrative with the dangerous reality that many defenders face? Um, so Guada, the floor is, floor is yours. You have to unmute. I thought I was prepared, but obviously I wasn't. I did other things. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Good. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Maybe just if I start by uh, congratulating everybody for this guide, in particular, obviously, the International Service for having the vision to commissioning it, but also to Tom and to Sophie, the authors and researchers. 
I do think it is key that we as the human rights movement keep revisiting how we campaign, revisiting how we communicate, you know, questioning what we've been doing to hopefully win more hearts and minds, which is something that we've always been doing, and to stop um, the grave human rights violations that we all uh, we are all trying to to stop. I think, um, and I think the Assistant Secretary uh, Gen uh, Secretary General just a few a few seconds ago did say, you know, the importance of not just preaching to the converted. I suggest that at some point, I, at the end of the 20th century beginning, we sort of, we just became part of a little algorithm, even though the algorithms, we didn't know that that's what they were called. And we started mainly talking to ourselves, I think, and not realizing how we needed to reach more people we had reached quite a few um, during the uh, after the Universal Declaration came into force, and then you know the human rights movement started building up as we know it now. But I think at some point we became stagnated. So I do think that this new emphasis on making sure our narratives center around the benefits of human rights, focus on the achievements of uh, those who defend human rights instead of only defining them, as the guide clearly states by the dangers and the risk they face, I think it's a good way forward and hopefully will yield results. I think also that this issue of emphasizing a better tomorrow, emphasizing our shared humanity and stressing that together we can achieve more, uh, will hopefully do, do the trick. At Amnesty, as you as you asked me to to uh, stress here, yes, we have been, you know, we have started to use hopefully more and better value-based uh, narratives in our campaigning, and I would like to highlight two here uh, that I thought hopefully did the trick or are going to do the trick, although, well, measuring impact, as we all know, is not straightforward. And I'll talk about impact in a minute as well. I noticed that some people in the chat have already sort of started sort of asking about that, how to be proof that this is working. But one particular uh, campaign or aspect of a campaign that we um, kicked off a few years ago was the I Welcome campaign. And it was about sort of putting pressure on governments and asking citizens, you know, to welcome, ref uh, to welcome refugees. And in that particular campaign, we issued a video, a very simple video, which uh, in which two people from different cultures, sexes, ages, you know, sat opposite each other. They didn't know each other, but they were sitting opposite each other for a few minutes in silence. And quite quickly, those two people started smiling at each other, started talking to each other. And so the message there was, listen, we have more in common, you know, than what we think we have, despite our differences. And again, building on the recognition of our shared humanity, a key recommendation of the guide, that video, I suggest, actually did. And another um, campaign that I would like to an action that we took uh, quite recently at the end of 2019 on highlighting the plight and the issues of women human rights um, defenders. It was a campaign to uh, recognize and protect women human rights defenders. And in that there, as part of the materials we produced, our global briefing, which is one, the briefing that, you know, in particular my sort of teams uh, produce, we highlighted not only the attacks and the violations that uh, women human rights defenders face, which I, you know here are many in many fold, but we also highlighted and showcased their achievements, you know, what, what they were doing. So we um, highlighted narratives that focus on what their motivations were, what the achievements were, what objectives they had and the impact they had in, they had in, the, in their campaigns. Did we, and I'll, and I'll put on the chat in a minute when we finish, uh, you know, these two campaigns so that people can have a look, you know, the global briefing on women human rights defenders to see what you think. On the issue of, well, did we manage to win more hearts and minds? What is, was this affected? Well, 
I think the jury is still out. Although I was very pleased because it's very difficult in human rights, as we all know, and not only the panelists here, but I suggest even the audience, you know, that cause and effect. So many things play play a part in 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 impact, you know. But I was very pleased again to hear just now uh, the Assistant Secretary General saying, "Well, who would have you know imagined that women human rights defenders, you know, went to the Security Council and you and told this story?" So I think there has been some improvement. Was it necessarily because of the new narratives that we are presenting or not? Well, I, I, I think it is, but uh, who knows? And maybe here, you know, a plea maybe to Tom, maybe to the, to, the, to the service or to Sophie, you know, maybe the next guidelines have to be as to how we track impact with these new narratives. Are we really reaching out to those who haven't, uh, weren't our traditional allies? Are we, you know, make, not just talking to our friends, but by using hope-based uh, hope based, uh, narratives, are we sort of uh, bringing more people to the cause? Because at the end of the day, and I always say that, and I think this is key, I don't know whether people here and those of you who speak Spanish who have, who have followed Latin American sort of uh, politics and movements and things, you know, el pueblo unido jamás era vencido. If we're all in this together, it's very difficult. It's very, it, I think those in power will sort of stick to, to what we want them to stick and that is sort of respecting all our human rights. Uh, I do not think, and I'm I'm, all, I'm almost finished. I know that I only had a few minutes. I do not think that we obviously can avoid exposing, and most people here have said it already and also in the chat, exposing the dangerous realities that defenders face and others, you know, and then the human rights violations, which are awful. But I do think, and I, so I do think that we need to have to continue naming the violation, the violations. But I am hopeful that by showcasing the, the positive impact, for example, that human rights defenders have in creating a better world. You know, we will be encouraging others to play their part in creating this uh, fairer world that we all want to, to create. And finally, perhaps just again, uh, congratulate you all for this guide, but um, what, what next? I think, well, from uh, as amnesty, I commit, you know, that we will be distributing and we will be you sort of using it in, in, in our workshops and encouraging people, not only within our activists and within my staff colleagues, but also in other forums that um, I and the organization is part of, you know, encouraging people to using it and to trying it out. You know, at the end of the day, um, it is key that we try these new ideas, uh, the ideas out, test them out, because as I said at very early, if we don't sort of shift and try new things, we may just become stagnated. That's all from me. Thank you very much. Look forward to the questions. Thank you, Guada. Um, so yeah, I will now take. We will now take some questions from the audience. I have three questions here. So the first one is for Mary. Uh, because I know you have to run after that. What are the effective ways uh, civil society uh, should use when trying to engage with countries like China? Well, I think uh, you, you should engage with every country in the same way. Uh, you should respect, as uh, we've heard today, the common humanity. Uh, you should respect the fact that um, we all agree that nobody should be tortured or nobody should be uh, executed or nobody uh, should be imprisoned unjustly um, as human beings. Now, when a country has political and strategic interests and different interpretations, that, that changes things. So I've had three meetings with China and um, I, and I have a special interest, I should uh, say this, I have a, a special fondness for China because my mother was born in Shanghai and uh, it brought me up on uh, stories about uh, China. Um, so if I, when I engage with China, uh, and, I, and I should say that I, I, the next report to the uh, 
General Assembly is on long-term detention of human rights defenders, as some of you know, and I picked 10 years as a kind of a, 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 a straightforward decade. So I have sent China a communication, which is public and a press release the other day um, uh, was issued, whereby I, I went, I trawled through all the, um, all the communication since 2000 when the mandate, 2001 when the mandate set up and um, uh, sent a, a missile with 17 uh, human rights defenders, 13 of whom had been imprisoned for longer than 10 years, one for as much as 23 years and one over his lifetime to date uh, for 30 plus years. And I have talked to the Chinese uh, embassy about these cases. Um, uh, on several occasions, and um, and I have said that if anything positive happens, I will acknowledge it. I think that's really important for civil society, that if anything positive happens within a country, that you acknowledge it, um, because governments, you know, with civil society, like in the in the seventies when I started, you just governments were over there and. Um, a civil society was over here and there was a never any engagement much. They were the baddies, we were the goodies. And then uh, governments adopted all the rhetoric and there's a lot of rhetoric as we all know and very little implementation in some cases. But, but it is only true in my view, um, you know, pointing out uh, the, the, the good things they're doing. So for example, with China, they have made huge advances against poverty. They brought in a really good law on violence against women. So these are positive things. Now on the downside, their treatment of human rights defenders is deplorable and is, it should, you, you need to call it out. Narratives are no narratives. Um, you know, there's no way you can put a gloss on that. Um, and the access to healthcare and access to uh, family um, and lawyers. Um, so, so I would say that I would also think that all countries, the thing that they really hate is damage to their reputation. And I've seen this has been reinforced through my. Um, to my engagements with uh, uh, member states since I took up the, ma the mandate. They do not like negative publicity or any kind of damage to their reputation. So I think part of the framing and part of the priming should be in terms of how something will be, uh, how their reputation will be damaged, you know, or that they need they need a win or, or they need to do something. And um, for example, I'll give you an example in Iran. Um, I spoke to the ambassador about a human rights defender there who had cancer and was dying. And uh, I said, you know, I'm just on a human basis, like it's Ramadan. Uh, can, can you just see if they would release this man uh, so that at least uh, he will, you know, he can die. Uh, and, and I also asked for his wife to be released so that they could have some time together before he died. Now, they didn't release his wife. He was released. Obviously, it was a collective effort. I'm not saying it was me. But, but you know, uh, appealing to people on a, on a human basis, I think, can sometimes uh, work better than the human rights language that we have boxed ourselves into so often. Um, uh, and then, as Ilza said, you know, all, it's all about coalition building, it's about creating awareness. All, lots of human rights defenders tell me their protection comes from their networks and their, the, the, the engagement with governments comes from the strength of them as part of a network. Um, so they were, they would be the thing. Now I don't know if this. I saw this question and it's anonymous, so I don't know whether the person is inside or outside. So obviously there are, are different challenges, um, but generally I think uh, you know that they they are the tax that I would take. Thanks. Thanks. I have another question here, maybe for Tom or Sophie. Um, so it's it's from Dominique. Uh, she or he says that uh, they are actually working on a curriculum to explain human rights to kids and adults, and uh, they they want to use uh, right as a powerful word and with a clear meaning, and not the meaning which is often understood as good or bad. 
Uh, so what are your advices on this? Can you hear me? Great. Um, I think I think I followed. That sounds like a really interesting uh, project, um, and definitely uh, uh, it just as a as a bit of a aside. But for any kind of political issue, when it comes to the messaging, one of the first kind of things I will go through is how would this issue um, play out in the schoolyard? You know, who 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 would how would how could we express it in terms that everyone's going to understand? And where some of those fundamental notions of this is this is the right way to behave or, or not a great way to behave are really kind of clear at that at that playground level. Um, so so th 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 that's something to think about in terms of the question. I'm not sure I quite followed the idea of of using the word um, right. Like obviously, I guess um, you have to work with within reason of some of the established kind of uh, rules of language or understanding of them. So I'm not quite sure how we would. Uh, my, my, my understanding of the question is that the word right is used as in right and wrong uh, and as human rights as well. Um, so I don't think there's any way really around that. But I think, yeah, I would, I would definitely encourage um, uh, any human rights communications to try to get back to that basic schoolyard uh, level of making sure that um, the, the, the fundamental kind of truths about life um, that we know in, from primary school or secondary school um, are really still quite relevant as we as we become adults. So that kind of the golden rule, uh, so to speak, is you know um, treat other people how you want to be treated. This is something we're taught very young, or in kindergarten we're taught to cooperate and play nicely with the other children. These are kind of fundamental rules that actually um, you know we should be following through in in, in adulthood and sometimes reminding people um, that it really is that basic can be incredibly um, powerful. And I think like Mary said, and this sort of goes to, to strategy or your tactics, but really you wanna give people those options where you say, well, this would be the wrong thing to do. This would be the right thing to do. And you know, there is an element um, of, of self-reflection and, and potential shame. People don't wanna be ashamed to be doing the wrong, the wrong thing. So you sort of wanna, it's a little bit carrot and stick, but definitely a lot more carrot to get people um, on, on side. So I'm not sure, Dominic, sorry if I've, I might have butchered that answer. I'm not quite sure if I followed the question, but um, feel free to, to, to follow up with, in a, with an email as well and I'll engage that way. Thanks, Tom. Um, we have a further question here and maybe after that, I will give the floor to, to Thomas. Uh, Thomas is, uh, I'm going to introduce you, Thomas, so maybe you can answer also the question. Thomas um, is um, um, a, com a communication specialist. Um, he's a human rights strategist, and he's also the founder of Hope Based Communication. And he has been accompanying ISHR in this narrative journey for several years now. Um, and the question is um, um, from Michael, he says, how do we shift our collective narrative? Where do you think the movement overall is currently at in this journey of switching the com to compost and away from pesticides? He says the, 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 using Tom's metaphor now about compost and our own pesticide as in self-defeating narratives. Um, so where are we now? And maybe, I don't know, Thomas and Guada, if you have some insights on that. Thanks, Marianne, and thanks, Michael, for the question. I think the most important thing that we take away from all of this, from this work, is we make the narrative uh, with the words we use in the stories we tell every day. Uh, the, the guide itself uses the idea of um, narratives are a mosaic that we put together every day. Um, but it's actually quite hard to talk about what we are for. So I, I think we should all be really grateful to ISHR for this document. Um, which to build on this soil metaphor, it's a little bit like they've planted a tree for us all to use. And now it's up to all of us to use it. We need to use this, um, this messaging, this articulation of what we stand for as a lens through which we approach all our work. Um, the goal of all communications is to deliver our message and reinforce our moral worldview. Uh, and above all that is through repetition. So all of us here now need to take this on and move forward with it together. 
Uh, and I want to also do a nice way to bring this session to a close um, with my intervention would be to give you just three practical things that we can all do, um, which is a little bit of a tool I also use for interview preparation, but surprise, story, and solution. So when I say surprise, I mean surprise people by using the, the messaging in this guide to make the moral case for human rights in moments when people might not be expecting us to. So the people who want to undermine human rights with narratives of hate and division expect us to res respond in kind. And what surprises them and puts them off their guard are narratives of love and unity and shared humanity, um, which the guide says really beautifully. And it's just something we need to get better at doing. We need to water and give sunlight to this wonderful tree through repetition and activate this moral worldview in the minds of the people we're speaking to. Um, the second is stories. We all have the power to reinforce this narrative by telling stories every day um, that reinforce this narrative of shared humanity, of people acting with humanity, that we're all human beings. Essentially, we need to go take the seeds from this tree and go away with them and plant them elsewhere. And that's something we can do every day. We can, uh, by elevating stories we see that are happening that illustrate and reinforce our worldview. Many people have found it very easy to find stories that spread hate and make us afraid of other people. We need to find stories that trigger admiration uh, in, in other people's humanity, empathy, generosity. And finally, solutions. So use this language to show that human rights is a tool for making change happen. I think the lesson that we all have to take away from COVID, right, is that the way we move forward on this planet is we're all connected. We have to work together and we have to use that frame when we're calling for action. Uh, the perfect language, again, provided by this guy, we are all part of the same human family um, and we need to repeat these ideas over and over again. Um, the last thing I'll say is uh, I come to narrative from this perspective of hope uh, as does this work. And I think that narrative is really closely associated with hope because it involves talking about not what is today, which is obviously really important work that motivates all of us. Working on narrative involves talking about what could be uh, and what should be. Uh, and so I guess the most important thing for us all to do is embrace that message from this guide of talking about hope and shared humanity. Thank you. Thanks, Thomas. Um, um, so um, maybe because we are running out of time, I, um, I want to give you the floor, Thomas, to maybe do, do the last, the closing remarks. And especially, what do you think should be the next steps for campaigners and communicators now, now that the guide exists? A little bit, Mary, and then my answer to the last question were those last words. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I wanted to make sure that you didn't have like something else. Good. So um, as we finish, uh, I I'm, I'm want to ask uh, Diego to, um, to, to, to send a quick poll. Yeah, now you can see the quick poll. Um, to close this launch in a more interactive way and for us to understand how useful you find the guide and the narrative we are putting forward. So please help us to answer it. Um, there are no hard and fast rules when it comes to narrative and messaging work. We know that shifting narratives takes time. It's an ongoing effort and we really hope uh, the ideas and principles in the guide, guide will be useful. But please uh, contact our team um, with any feedback or ideas as our efforts to sharpen our strategic messaging is ongoing. Um, thank you so much for attending our lunch today. Thanks to all our panelists. Uh, I wish we had more time because I know some questions were remained unanswered, um, uh, but please feel free to, to send them uh, to our emails afterwards and to continue the conversation online. And I wish you all a nice uh, rest of the day.